Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm here today with Mary Robertson and Emma Schwartz, the Emmy-winning executive producer and director and co-executive producer and director, respectively, of the four-part Plus One investigation discovery docuseries, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, I have a million questions, but we only have 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> firstly, how has it felt to see your series become such a viral sensation, stimulate discussion, uh, not to mention shock and outrage uh, about the treatment of children in TV. Uh, Mary, let's start with you. Sure, Ray, it's been gratifying. It's been inspiring to observe the reaction to Quiet On Set. Um, we've seen a lot of positivity in the responses. We've seen a lot of our contributors met with generosity and compassion by those who are viewing. And thank you to everyone who has watched. Thank you to everyone who is bringing their big feelings to their responses and, um, you know, creating an environment in which other survivors hopefully feel comfortable sharing their stories as well. And uh, Emma, uh, same question to you. Yeah, I think, you know, whenever you put something together, put a story out, put a documentary out, you sort of hope that, uh, you know, people will watch, people will care, people will feel as much as you did putting into it. And so it's, um, you know, sort of overwhelming and incredibly exciting to see the response here. And I think one of the the most, um, most exciting parts of that is really to see how many people are not just um, uh, impacted by watching it, but want to sort of take action or change or, you know, improve the environment in which these problems occur. And I think that is, you know, taking the work to a next level and something that you would sort of hope for. Yeah, that's always the, that's always the goal, obviously. Um, what was the catalyst that inspired you to want to tackle this subject in the first place, uh, Emma? Do you want to start, Mary, and then I'll jump in? Okay, or Mary. Sure. Uh, we had noticed a proliferation of videos online. They were montages of clips from um, clips that were recorded on sets that Dan Schneider had presided over. And in some of these clips, you saw young teens featured in scenes that were arguably sexual in nature. One example is a scene in which you see Ariana Grande leaning off the side of a bed and pouring a, a bottle, of, bottle of water on her chest and her face. You see her Ariana Grande squeezing a potato in a manner that's arguably sexual in nature, you see Jamie Lynn Spears receive a squirt of a viscous liquid on her face in a manner that is arguably evocative of pornography. And of course, Jamie Lynn Spears and Aria Grande are now women, but at the time they were young teens at the time of the, at which these clips were recorded. And we noticed that there were a lot of questions um, on social media swirling around these particular clips. A lot of the questions came from now adults who had grown up watching these shows and were aghast and surprised, wondering, had I grown up watching a lot of sexualized content and didn't realize it at the time because the jokes went over my head? Um, if if shows were made or skits or behind the scenes material was made that was arguably sexual in nature and featured kids, which adult said yes to this? Which adult said no to this? If this type of content was created, um, what might it portend or signal about what else was happening behind the scenes that was that would verge from inappropriate to illegal? And Emma and I think that these are a meaningful set of questions, um, meaningful because they pertain to the working conditions for children, period, and then meaningful because they also, uh, you know, the content that was created on these sets was then distributed to children, right? It was consumed by impressionable young minds and it influenced their sense of no of normal. I know Emma I has- think, No, I'm sorry, go ahead. There yeah, and go. I think sort of the, uh, you know, as this was occurring, right? You know, um, uh, Jeanette McCurdy had come up with her memoir, Kate Taylor at Business Insider had um, written a story that really uh, moved the ball forward in terms of our understanding of what was happening behind the scenes on Dan's sets. And, you know, those sort of coalesced to a point where we said we want to dig in further and we partnered with Kate and, you know, began to, you know, continue that outreach to more and more people and, you know, reached out to hundreds of people from behind the scenes, from in front of the camera and very quickly began to hear from people who said, I'm really glad that you're digging in. There's a lot to unearth here. And I think what you see in Quiet On Set is, you know, ultimately the results of, of that effort where there were people who had been holding um, a lot of experiences, a lot of trauma, a lot of, um, 
a lot of what they went through very close and very quiet for many years, if not decades, and um, wanted to share their stories in hopes that by shedding light on what they had went through, that they might help others not go through that or, you know, begin to change the environments going forward. Yeah, I was going to, you know, watching so much sexualized content and toxic and inappropriate behavior on the set, uh, to, this is for both of you, left me wondering where the studio teachers were and why they didn't see fit to intervene. I, I thought their primary job besides education was to protect the kids. Mary? Do you want to well, take that? Up? Yeah, so, you know, look, I think one of the... Um, the things that you hear from from parents, from kids, from really anyone you talk to is that there's an incredible power dynamic at play on these sets, right? People want to stay employed, they want to stay working, whether it's a child actor or a studio teacher or a crew member. And the ability to speak up, many felt was hampered by that sort of, uh, that kind of environment. And I think especially when you have a showrunner who has so much power and, you know, can, have a good day but a bad day and you never quite know what you're going to get that only creates an environment of further uncertainty for people's sort of job security and that you know that is not an environment that makes it easy for people to come forward when they want to as i think you'll you see in in the in the doc you know brian and other former child actors talk about how they would sort of ask the kids to stay longer now there's lots of adults watching that happen but the incentive is oh, you're having a good time you really want to get it right but when that happens over and over again, that is an environment that's conducive to sort of other challenges. And I think that's really um, one of the um, important sort of realities that, you know, happens behind the scenes outside of sort of the, the paper of, oh, look, there are adults, there are studio teachers, there are people there, and yet these things still happen. And it's true, Dan, Dan Schneider is really depicted as being so intimidating to every adult and, and obviously, Every uh, uh, every teen and child uh, and crew member uh, in his midst, he responded to allegations about his culpability uh, in the improper content on shows he presided over on Nickelodeon, as well as the alleged hostile work environment and intimidation of the cast and crew. What was your take on the video interview he did, expressing expressing that uh, measure of regret after the fact, uh, Mary? We've offered we offered Dan the opportunity to participate in the original four episodes. Um, he declined to participate. Um, we've we've viewed his video. Um, and in our fifth episode, at, which just aired on Sunday, actually, you hear from some of the contributors about their response to his video um, and the ways in which, you know, perhaps they found it to be lacking. It uh, yeah, I, I know that you you actually had material from, I mean, responses from him that were written um, that I guess, so I guess he did respond as you were doing research, but it was, uh, but it was more in writing, it seemed, than, than, than uh, on camera. Well, so what happened is we offered him an opportunity to, to interview on camera. He declined the opportunity to participate on camera, but we still felt that there were things that we wanted to offer him an opportunity to respond to. And so the uh, comment cards that we have in the documentary are us incorporating those written responses that he gave us after declining to participate on camera. The fact that Nickelodeon's sole response to this um, devastating series is its statement at the end of each installment rather sp speaks volumes uh, to my mind. Uh, I imagine you gave them a chance as you did Dan uh, to answer in a more significant way on camera, including about the child predators being hired for their shows. We also offered Nickelodeon a chance to have somebody speak on camera. They likewise declined to offer anyone on camera. And so we sent them a series of written questions and received a, a statement back, which is incorporated in each of the episodes um, in, in the series. I think that part of what we're hearing right now is a call for industry-wide reform. Uh, many are talking about how there's the, an absence of federal legislation that regulates these um, work environments for children, specifically, you know, film and television sets at the moment. There's just a patchwork of state laws in place. Yeah, it seemed like, like you know, Me Too did ultimately uh, claim Dan Schneider as a victim, but, but it still seems to have been slow to some degree to respond to the child end of things rather than just the f female adult end of things. Um, you know, that that somebody like like 
Dan Schneider and the allegations you make it, you know, we see, uh, you know, we, we can imagine that 20 years ago it was different and he was able to get away with much more than he would have if he had started in TV today. But still, you're right, there needs to be some kind of some more industry wide regulation and reform. I mean, a couple of the things that we're hearing people who participated in the doc or people who are in this community talk about, for instance, are, um, you know, there's not a, a law, not even on a state level, that bars a registered sex offender from working on a set. You know, a studio can have their own requirements for background checks, but it's not, you know, required by law, saying the same way we might prevent that from schools. Um, there's also discussions about whether there should be more resources um, readily available to children working on sets and whether that's mental health specialists or social workers, people who are sort of outside of that realm of a, um, a parent or a boss or another employee, someone who's just a, a, a resource for where they might feel uncomfortable but not sure who else to talk to and you know, other ideas you know, coming out in, in conversations. What can either of you tell me about uh, the decisions you made in crafting the documentary? You seem to be pretty fearless in the way you presented the material. We're, were there any worries at all about slander or overstepping? We're very careful um, in our process. Um, we make sure that you know allegations that have been included are substantiated. We uh, undertake our own rigorous review. We undertake several rigorous legal reviews. Um, so we stand behind that, which has been included in the material in the in the series. Um, you know, and there are a lot of questions and considerations when it comes to craft that we took very seriously as well. We wanted to craft, craft visual environments um, that evoked the behind the scenes spaces where previously so many of these stories had been relegated to the behind the scenes environments. They had been whispered, but the contributors hadn't previously really had opportunity um, to bring their accounts to center stage, if you will. So it was important to us to create visually a space that was evocative of sort of, you know, behind the scenes, being, excuse me, behind the scenes spaces turned center stage spaces. We also, you know, thought deeply, deeply in the edit about the amount of music that we were using and the type of music. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, the music, um, wasn't taking liberties um, that we were really focusing as much as possible on what the contributors were saying. Right. You mean, so the music was, it wasn't manipulative. It was important to us that the music, um, you know, reflect the existing emotion in the, in the scene um, rather than I think layer on emotion that might not be present. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's no music, you know, certainly in the third episode in which Drake Bell shares his story, we scaled the music way, way back. His interview, my God, Drake Bell's interview is just devastating. I mean, it demonstrates such courage for uh, him to have agreed to speak about his abuse on camera for the first time, particularly when he knew Brian Peck had so many high profile supporters, po probably still out there. Um, uh, was that a difficult process convincing him to participate? Um, it's never easy for anyone to decide to speak on camera and certainly not somebody who's been through, um, you know, incredible trauma sort of sharing that with the world. But, um, you know, at a, at a certain juncture, you know, we understood that there were two men who had been arrested in a very short period of time in 2003 and convicted as child sex offenders, all working on the same set at Nickelodeon and, you know, came to understand that, you know, Drake was the victim of Brian Peck. And so, you know, I reached out to him. I didn't know where he was in that sort of process of dealing with his trauma, of healing, and whether he would even be receptive to my outreach. And, you know, that began a back and forth, but it wasn't an overnight decision. I think it reached him in a time in his own life when he was trying to face that trauma head on and, you know, came into a place where um, he felt that, you know, sharing that was part of his, his own step forward in healing as well. But it's, it's never an easy journey. And even, you know, after the interview, we, we, you know, it's day by day about how that feels about, you know, it's reception, just sort of, it's a, it's a process. And I think you, when you've been through that kind of trauma, you live with it for the rest of your life. And it's about finding a way forward, but it doesn't go away. It's just wrenching, watching but um, you handled that, I thought, incredibly um, with great taste and sensitivity. Um, 
but you you you've got a huge amount of participation from people involved in this sh in their shows um and these people in general had nothing to gain other than uh i guess maybe purging their soul and uh like and as you've said trying to maybe help the next generation uh be on the lookout and be vigilant uh in their own participation in shows i was was that was that what you'd gathered from these people uh from from the the voices and the actors who participated that they they had their eye on the, on the future generation you want to start up yeah i mean i think you know for everybody when you reach out you want to understand where they're coming from what's important to them and um you know what they've been through what they might want to share and and why that's important i think for a lot of people it was hoping that their stories could help other people navigate this world better and potentially, you know, create more protections. Everyone had their own sort of specifics, but absolutely. I think when you work on a project like this, you enter into a type of covenant with the participants um, in which in essence, you're saying, come with me, hold my hand figuratively, and we're going to go on this journey. And we hope that in creating this work together, um, we're able to engage a large audience and that through that engagement, were, you know, there is impact, there are shifts in perception and cultural standards. Um, it's never a promise because you can never guarantee large engagement. You can never guarantee impact. You can never guarantee cultural shifts. And um, this has been a particularly gratifying experience because, because of the response to the film. So thank you to everyone who's watching and, you know, created an environment that, um, you know, is hospitable. And it was that response to the film, I guess, that prompted the decision to quickly put together a fifth install. Yes, it was about a month before, uh, well, it was about a month ago in which we decided to pursue a fifth episode. We saw that even after just the release of the trailer alone, there were swirling questions, a debate had been ignited um, around some of the particulars of the series, the original four episodes, and we thought um, that we have value that we can add in that moment by bringing some of the contributors forward again and giving them the opportunity to engage in, with these questions. And you know, we set out to work. <laughs> Have you gotten any negative response from people saying that these people are lying or has it been, has that not been the case? I mean, I think we we very much, um, you know, stand by the, the works and the stories that we put together and have seen an overwhelmingly positive response um, yeah. from the public. The response has been so voluminous, it's nearly impossible to track all of it. But the vast majority of what we're seeing is really positive and compassionate. Okay, we're going to wrap things there. Uh, the disturbing and powerful Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV is available to watch on demand on Max and other streaming platforms. Mary Robertson and Emma Schwartz, best of luck this Emmy season. And thanks for joining us today at Gold Derby. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.